Welcome back to our keynote session. It's a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker of the advanced cell systems session, uh, Professor Santil Muchuswami. Uh, he received his PhD from the McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, and did a postdoctoral uh, work with uh, Johan Brucke at the Harvard Med Medical School. After that, he moved for his first independent faculty position to the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York and to the Princess uh, Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto uh, afterwards. Then in 2015, he moved to the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to direct the cell biology program at the uh, cancer center there. Sentil uh, is a recipient uh, of a number of awarded, awards, uh, among them the Rita Allen Scholar Award, uh, the V Foundation Scholar Award, the US Army Area and Hope Scholar Award, and the, Canadian, and, uh, the award of the Canadian Society of Biochemistry and Molecular and Cellular Biology for young scientists that were awarded uh, to him for his outstanding research achievements. His lab is uh, pioneering in the, on one side in the development uh, and the use of three-dimensional co-culture methods uh, for modeling carcinoma of breast and pancreas cancer and also the understanding uh, role, the role of uh, the cell polarity of proteins in the regulation in uh, processes of biology in cancer. His group uh, continues to investigate and discover uh, how these uh, cell polarity proteins regulate the cell biology and uh, compared to normal cells uh, and its impact on the stress and the adaptation and, uh, and as well the therapy resistance. He's working together with his team also in the development and the implementation of uh, personalized tumor organoids uh, and uh, uh, develops platform out of that, uh, which can hopefully assist in future patients and oncologists uh, by performing a lab-based screen of the available treatment options to ad identify the best possible cancer treatments for each patient. So we are delighted to have uh, Sentinel Muchuswami in our conference, and uh, we are looking forward to his keynote presentation where he will tell us more about tumor organoids for cancer biology and personalized medicine. Great. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, share the screen and see if it works okay. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, I want to thank you, um, you and the team, for inviting me to give this lecture. It's an honor. And I also want to thank, thank all the people who are um, online making time to listen to what we are doing and what we want to say. Uh, so what my lab is really interested in using three-dimensional cultures and, and other methods in the context of discovery research at the same time doing translation research. And um, as you, as Christian pointed out, um, we our program on the research in my lab um, broadly spans from basic cell biology processes such as cell polarity um, and to all the way to translational research. Uh, and the three-dimensional cultural organoids are the technology platforms that bridge these type of efforts. Um, in light of the focus of this conference, my I will not talk about cell polarity proteins today. I'll talk about all our efforts in the context of translational research and using organoids. So my interest in the idea of using three-dimensional culture or organoids uh, came from my study during my time in as a PhD student. So as many of you who are trainees um, would probably be learning about a lot of things in, 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 in your uh, cell biology and molecular biology courses. But I came from a different discipline to start my PhD. So I wanted to know what cancer is all about. So the first course I took, one of the first courses I took, uh, was a pathology course taught to medical students. And it was very interesting and eye-opening experience because what I learned during that course still stays with me today. And I learned that even today, cancer is diagnosed based on morphological criteria by pathologists. 
So laboratory pathologist and, and uh, anatomical pathologist will look at the tissue, look at the morphology of the tissue and make judgments based on the basis of the way it looks, the way the nuclear cytoplasmic ratios are, the, the way in which the nuclear size is regulated, morphology is regulated, uh, is, is um, displayed to determine whether you have a, what stage of cancer and what grade of cancer you, the patient has. We also learned that the tumor grows as a three-dimensional ball of structures. However, when, when I go back to the lab, even at that time during my PhD days, most of my work initially was performed using fibroblasts. So this is in the um, late 80s, early 90s. And where we take an oncogene of interest, which we think can be or potentially and, and cancer-causing oncogene, express it in fibroblasts and do assays like serum-independent serum growth and loss of contact inhibition, et cetera, or even growth in soft agar. Those assays, while they were very informative in telling us what, what, is, what is an oncogene and how it functions, it had no relationship to what I learned in the pathology course. So this really stuck with me, and I began to, to consider the possibility of, of going beyond these culture models. So when I started my postdoc um, in John Brugge's lab um, in, in uh, Merlin, uh, mid late 90s or mid to late 90s, uh, what we decided to do is to really establish a collaboration with people like Mina Bissell to begin to grow epithelial cells in three-dimensional context. So some of the early work um, in my lab, some of it is still continues in my lab, uses this human memory epithelial cell line called MCF10A. These are considered to be normal-like because they don't have dramatic alterations in their genome. Um, what they have is subtle. And in addition, they are very, they're strictly growth factor dependent and they, are, they do not form tumors in nude mice and so forth, meaning that they are not transformed. So in that gene, in that cell line, we express this oncogene RB2, which I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with, um, it's, it's a receptor tyrosine kinase that is implicated in multiple cancers prominently in the breast. And there are several drugs, both targeted therapies like lapatinib um, and also antibodies like Herceptin are used in the clinic today. And they're significantly benefiting the patients who have these disease, this, this oncogene-driven uh, tumor. So in addition to expressing these oncogene in these mcf 10 cells and growing them on a plastic dish, what we also decided to do is to develop conditions to grow them in a three-dimensional context. So a contrast to the left, where you see the monolayer that is, that is contact inhibited and stopped in proliferation, the same cells when grown in a three-dimensional context don't know how to stop. Also, they don't know how to organize themselves in a, in a, in a three-dimensional uh, structure, completely amorph amorph amorphous um, in, in the way they look. And when analyzed these by immunohistochemistry and IHC, we began to realize that in fact, when you, once you grow these epithelial cells in three-dimensional context, you're beginning to see aspects of biology that otherwise could not be seen. This really set the stage for um, how we do research in the lab and how I actually decided to build my research program in the past 20 years or so. Uh, to really think about epithelial cancers and carcinomas you know, by growing them in three dimensions and begin to ask questions that otherwise were not possible. This was a long time ago. So this was 2001, as you can see in the bottom. There was an opinion or a mini review written by um, prominent uh, leaders in the field, Tyler Jackson Weinberg. And the most interesting aspects of this review, mini review article is the last sentence. It says, suddenly the study of the cancer cells in two dimensions seems quaint, if not archaic. So when, when I was looking for my positions or jobs, if you will, and when this mini review came out, I was very excited because I thought, well, this is gonna be really great because I should be able to apply and people will be really ready to give me jobs or wherever I apply. But uh, that was not the case. There was tremendous amount of pushback. Um, and some of the statements made are listed here, and these are true statements, and I'm only listing about a small number of them. So just because there is difference in 2D doesn't mean they're important. How do you know this is really going to tell you anything that you don't already know, and why do we need 3D at all? Why can't we just stick to 2D? And so this was very humbling. Nevertheless, 
um, I was lucky enough to get some positions um, and, and continue on to do what I wanted to do, uh, what I have done so far, uh, starting with Cold Spring Harbor. So today, most of you don't really think about this 3D culture, more, but more of an organoids. And I think and there is a reason why we do this because, and I'll explain to you in a minute, um, and the concept of growing organoids or mini organ-like structures is not new. Um, and it has been around for a very long time. So this, this, the, some of the earlier, earliest work was done in the 1970s when primary hepatocytes um, were grown in floating collagen gels. And I think the most important, as, there are two important aspects to what, what constitutes an organ, organoid. Um, one is that you restore the structure or mini organ-like structure it doesn't have to be, in all cases, a multi -cell, multi multiple cell type containing structure, but it has to recreate some aspects of tissue biology and morphology that's remnant of in vivo. And secondly, it should, create, it should recreate some aspects of the cellular function. So in this case, hepatocytes, for example, when you grow them in, in the collagen gels, they secrete cytochrome P450, other, which otherwise will not happen the same cells are growing on a 2D. The similar concept was actually demonstrated in mammary epithelial cells by a number of groups, mainly by Mina Bissell and Nandi and Vitalka, where if you take primary mammary epithelial cells or breast epithelial cells um, and put them in a monolayer culture, they will not secrete milk. However, the same cells, when you put them in a three dimensions, they form these acinal-like structures and they will not begin to secrete milk proteins, giving you the, giving the indication that you need to create form in this case 3D, to have the proper function, in this case, expression of milk proteins. So this, this concept um, is, has now been pioneered and by probably one of the most prominent uh, figures in the field, Hans Clevers, with the discovery of the, the generation of mini guts in 2009. And since then, um, he, he demonstrated the ability to generate organ, organoid-like structures in almost all organs you can think of. So this really put us in the map of really trying to use these, um, of these organ, organoid or mini organ-like structures, not only for biology, but also potentially for discovering new targets and also in, uh, tr translating um, into, into the clinical space. So with this background, what I will do today is to cover four different topics uh, for you. Uh, one is that how we are using these organoid-like structures to model cancer initiation. Uh, for pancreas cancer. And I'll tell you why that is important. And then the second, the, the second one is we want to know whether the organoids are in fact modeling in vivo drug response. And there are a lot of mistakes we made, people make, and we have, we have learned a lot from that. And I will tell you um, part of the story um, that, that where we have actually now understood exactly how to use organoid cultures to generate drug responses that are relevant for in vivo function. And then we will spend some time um, on talking about our efforts, so the first phase of our efforts in using organoids to personalize treatment cho choices. And this has been the most exciting application of organoids in, in my lab that I'm very excited about. Um, and last, lastly, I'll just spend a couple of minutes or maybe a minute or so where we are heading with this is to really use organoids for amino oncology and how they can be quite powerful and open us, open us, uh, give us opportunities that. Um, has not been available before. So in terms of um, the first question, which is, uh, can organoids be used in the context of, of modeling early lesions and also understanding pancreas development? Um, as some of you may know, human embryonic stem cells are quite actively used uh, in the context of regenerative medicine. And most prominently, human embryonic stem cells been used to generate beta islet cells of the pancreas so that you can be used, you, these cells can be used to, to um, treat patients with diabetes. Because that is possible, meaning that you can generate these beta islets in culture, we began to consider, this was a while ago, this was back in 2012 or so, we began asking if you can generate uh, the, the aspects of endocrine pancreas, which is the beta islet cells, why not um, generate exocrine pancreas from human embryonic stem cells? And the logic being, if you can model the exocrine pancreas, which is, based, which is the ducts and the acinar cells of the human pancreas system, 
perhaps we will be able to use them to express oncogenes and then model early stages of human cancer that otherwise could not be possible. So this was a bold question, but it was actually made feasible by a very talented junior, um, Ling Huang, who, who was a postdoc in my lab now, junior faculty uh, here at Beth Israel. Um, and, and their logics were very different, different from what other people think about, because we want to generate um, three-dimensional exocrine pancreas structures. These are ductal and astral structures. And because we're starting from pancreatic progenitor cells, we decided to think about ways in which we'll induce differentiation of these cells. Since we want to induce differentiation, we decided not to have any stem cell factors in the media, and there should be no serum so that there is no, there is no uncontrolled substance. We also considered all the epithelial and stromal factors that are relevant to pancreas, and we started adding them to the media as well. After about two, three, two years of optimization and more than 100 media conditions, we were able to generate from uh, pancreatic progenitor cells uh, exocrine pancreas structures that look that looks and has all the properties from a cell biological and molecular point of view of an, of an exocrine pancreas. So here you will see on the top, you, uh, over a period of time from day two to day 10, um, the, the, if you can see my mouse, but um, day, day 10, you will see these structures grow from a two cell to a three dimensional structure. And the outer rim is a collagen four, which is a base membrane. And the inner circle is a ZO1, which is a tight junction protein. So there is establishment of the apical base of polarity. And by day 16, these images are quite compelling in the way they are organized, meaning they have perfectly polarized epithelial structure, both by immunofluorescence and by uh, electron microscopy, where you can see the base membrane and the tight junctions. So this was, uh, this was spectacular in the sense we were able to generate ex exocrine epithelial cells. However, when we began to ask specific questions, are these ductal or are they acinar cells? We were surprised that they are neither ductal nor acinar. They were common progenitor-like cells that have all the properties of sometimes uh, sharing properties of both. So this was published in 2015. So then we began asking, can we now take this one step further and can specifically induce differentiation of ductal and acinar lineage restricted cells from these cells? Because this becomes important, because as you know, um, the, most of the pancreas cancer originates from acinar cells, at least that's what the evidence is. While ductal cells can also be uh, origins of pancreatic cancer, the, the, um, the cancer that originates in ductal cells seems to have a different etiology compared to those that originate from acinar cells. So we thought if you really wanna understand lineage tropism and biology of early disease, we need to have fairly pure ductal or acinar lineage restricted cells. So Ling went to the drawing board and began uh, establishing conditions to do so in coming up with media conditions that may actually uh, promote establishment of either duct-like or organoid-like uh, or acinar-like cells. And we were successful in doing that. And here is, here is a demonstration. I won't go into all the details, but uh, suffice to say that if you look at a few markers, SOX9 and CA2 that are usually highly expressed in the ductal lineage, the cells that induce differentiate in the ductal lineage. Um, so you can see the, the SOX9, um, the acinar cells, well, the SOX9 and CA2 are expressed in the ductal cells, the acinar lineages do not express them. And the converse is true. Uh, PTF1A is a transcription factor in the chymotrypsin. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide. So using these platforms, we decided to take an approach where um, we can model some of the precancerous lesions. And there are two types of lesions. Um, one is called the pancreatic, the panin lesions, which is the most common one. The, or the, the oncogene that drives this, um, this, this type of lesion is thought to be KERAS. And the cell of origin is most frequently thought to be acinar cells, although ductal and central acinar cells can contribute to these lesions. There is, there is a not completely distinct type of early uh, pancreatic cancer lesion, which is called the IPMN lesions. And these are thought to come in, originate in ductal cells and driven by, frequently, driven by this G protein coupled receptor called GNAS. Although both KRAS and GNAS are co-expressed in many of the carcinomas that are seen in patients today. 
So we decided to take an approach where we take either ductile or acid organoids and then express GNS and Keras. The logic being, if this model system to show lineage specific biology, then we may actually have an opportunity to model uh, the lesion in a way that nobody has been able to do it before. So here are some of the results. So when we express GNAS, which is the G, which we think uh, it should be more active in the ductal cells than acinar cells, and that's what we see. So for example, in the ductal cells, when we express GNAS, we see giant large cystic lesions that have increased in cell number, and I think, um, and also express mucins. And I'll show you some data, I'll um, show you some size comparisons in a minute. The same uh, oncogene is expressed in astronaut cells, however, um, the phenotype is much more subdued. And if you quantitate them, you will notice that uh, when we express in ductal organoids, there is an up to eight fold increase in the area of these uh, the cystic structures, whereas the same oncogene has only a three fold effect in, in um, acinar organoids. And more interestingly and importantly, these, um, the MUC2, which is considered to be in a, a marker for these IPMN lesions, is expressed only when, it is, when the oncogene is expressed in ductal organoids, but the acinar organoids fail to express this MUC2, giving us the first clear indication that as far as GNAS biology goes, there is cell type tropism, meaning GNAS can induce lesion-like phenotypes only in the ductal context, but fails to do so in an acinar context. When we did the same experiment with, um, um, with, with Keras in the ductal resin organoids, interestingly, both of them were equally potent in responding to Keras, meaning uh, if you look at the area that is occupied by the ductal organoids, Keras induces about you know, modest increase in size the cell proliferation goes up, the size goes up, but that phenotype is similar between ductal and acinar organoids. Um, and here's a morphology to make that case, saying that if you look at the ductal organoids, these are cystic structures that we see, and when you express Keras, they become larger, they become filled, and so forth. Acinar, on the other hand, um, the num although the numbers increased, but the morphology is strikingly different. So for example, if you look at the acinar organoids, we do not see any cystic lesions here. However, when we express them, when, uh, when we ac activate Keras, we begin to see these small cystic lesions. Those, this gave us the indication that maybe we are actually making these cells convert into a duct-like morphology. And for, for those of you who, are, who follow these literatures, you will know that in fact, the way in which Keras is thought to function by initiating an acinar cell is that it will first induce what is called as an acinar ductal metaplasia, or the ADM phenotype. Mm. The cells go through an ADM, and once they become um, a ductal-like, they progress to become pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So then we asked, um, do they express duct-like markers? And the, the answer was that they express many duct-like markers in the KRAS. And, and so giving us further confidence that maybe we are inducing ADM. The real interesting biology came when we took the same cells, the acinar, the ductal cells, and put and transplanted them into, into the pancreas of, um, of an immunocompromised mice. So in the top are ductal transplants, and in the bottom is an acinar transplant. These are all images taken to scale, um, and you will see this, this small lesion here. This is the ductal lesion. This is the lesion generated by injecting ductal cells expressing Keras. Whereas this here, this, this giant large thing which can't even fit in this field, is the lesion generated by acinar cells injected into the field. And when we zoom into this view, you can see a distinct morphological difference where well, these ones are beginning to look like pan and, and early stage uh, EP, uh, um, grade one lesions, whereas these ones are very um, subtle in their phenotype. And furthermore, we look at the, the percentage of success in, in generating these type of lesions, where it's very clear that in fact, in this initial experiment, the Keras expression in the ductal, we only got one of the mice growing any type of lesions, whereas in the acinar case, every single mice we transplanted uh, with the acinar organoids expressing Keras generated lesions. So again, for Keras, there is the opposite phenotype, which is the acinar cells are more sensitive to, uh, to induce a Keras um, phenotype, whereas the ductal cells were less sensitive compared to the acinar, uh, you know, which contrasts the, the, um, 
genus phenotype. So I think what we are beginning to have uh, extremely promising observations in that we may be able to actually begin to study the Keras and Genas um, lineage specific effects of uh, human pancreatic cancer using human progenitor derived um, stem cell organoids. And I think this, this makes us, uh, puts us in a, in a in sort of a new light in that it opens a Pandora's box of in terms of opportunities. We are now have, we have a whole program in trying to understand um, what are the initially initiating events that, that are triggered by Keras in the asinor cells that differ from ductal cells and vice versa for genus? What happens if you now layer in additional lesions like CDK and 2A, P53, and what do we, what do we see? And what are the markers that can be seen in, in um, normal versus when oncogene expressing cells? And can those be translated into the clinical space to, ident to detect um, pancreatic cancer at early stages, as you know? That is one of the holy grail um, in our ability to make, uh, help these patients because if the pancreatic cancer is diagnosed early in stage one or stage two in a patient, then surgical intervention uh, can significantly prolong the patient's lifespan. It's because we are unable to detect the cancer early and it is because the patients have metastatic disease by the time they're diagnosed that we have very dismal um, clinical prognosis for these patients. So we are hoping that this line of thinking and these approaches can, can have a major impact on our ability to uh, diagnose, to understand early lesions and, and use that knowledge to um, diagnose cancer you know, early in patients. So I'm gonna switch gears now because this was actually really focused in, in a long-term vision of coming with markers um, for detecting cancers early, but then we can also port this technology into helping patients who have pancreatic cancer today. Um, so the same approach um, that we did for the stem cell organoids, the same media, we adopted to grow pancreatic tumor organoids. And the, the procedure is rather straightforward that most of you should be familiar with by now because there are many articles published and many review articles written. And, and whether it is a resected tumor or a biopsy, we go through this process, we plate them and we generate organoids. And uh, the only difference is that we use the medias that do not have any stem cell factors because that's how we generated um, the media conditions in our previous work using stem cell organoids. And like, as I said in the beginning of my talk, um, one of the criteria we place in our, um, in our analysis is that we have to make sure that the patient's tumor or patient's tumor histomorphology and the organoid histomorphology are somewhat comparable to each other. So here is a patient tumor um, um, pancreatic patient tumor histomorphology um, that we generated and that was uh, diagnosed in, in Beth Israel in the hospital I work in here. These are the organoids that we grow in, 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 the, in the lab. And when you look at the histology, you can see uh, the morphological similarity between these two. And here is another example to show that, in fact, if you look at diverse morphology of the tissue um, histo histo architecture on the left and the organoids um, begin to look very similar or at least recreates elements of this histomorphology in a culture dish. Um, and also more, more than that, I think if you look at the molecular markers, whether it is SOX9 expression, GATA6 or GATA4, what we realized is that when a patient tumor is positive for a given marker, we usually see the expression of the same markers in the organoids, giving us confidence that the culture conditions does not dramatically alter the differentiation status of these epithelial cells when in the lab, in a laboratory setting, compared to what it is in the patient. And this is fundamentally important because if you really want to use these organoids for identifying um, therapeutic options that we can go back to the patient, you want to maintain them as close to the patient tumor st differentiation status as possible. So we think we are somewhat close to what, we, what is seen in a patient. Given, the, given there are the caveats, which I will talk about in a minute. So in addition, we look at, um, in addition to the heterogeneity that people always talk about, which is the genetic heterogeneity, which we also looked at to see whether um, different, whether the organoid is made up of a single genotype or multiple phenotype, genotype. And we did see diversity in the, in the, um, uh, the single cell level. Um, but we also uh, asked the very more important question, which is, do these organoids maintain uh, intrapatient phenotypic heterogeneity? And the reason this is important is, I'm sure you are very familiar with, 
that within, within one patient's tumor, there is significant variation in terms of gene expression profiles as well. What you may not be thinking about is that in addition to gene expression, the morphology of the tumor of a, within one patient vary, also varies. And I'll show you examples of that. So when we look at single cell sequencing from one organoid culture, we can see multiple phenotypic clusters. And this, we did this for four different patient organoids, uh, two, three, or maybe it's three or three different organoid uh, cultures. And in each cases, there is diversity in the population, meaning what this tells us is that the culture condition doesn't normalize all, or all the cells into one phenotype. We still maintain diversity in the, morphology, in the gene expression profiles. Now, the, the histomorphology I was talking about is here is one example. Um, and in the left, you will see um, it's one patient. This is a patient tissue. And one, one part of the tissue has this mucinous um, tumor epithelium, but as another portion of the same patient tumor has a very epithelial carcinoma-like um, of morphology. When we looked at the organoid generated from this patient yeah, under h &E, you can see organoids that look like mucinous lesions and organoids that look like epithelial lesions. And this is striking in my opinion because you're able to maintain within one color morphological diversity of a patient tumor that is seen in, in, in the matched patient. I think this uh, speaks loudly to what, uh, what we think, which is to maintain the differentiation status of the epithelial cells and to maintain the diversity of, of differentiation status within each patient to the best of our ability. And I think this also empowers us to think that what we test using these um, cells and culture is likely to have um, uh, potential clinical implications. So I won't go into the details. Uh, we actually went through a whole series of a battery of assays to demonstrate, in fact, that um, these are mini tumors or avatars of a patient. Now, um, as, as you can, as you already are probably thinking, that there are caveats to organoids, and the most prominent ones are there is absolutely no stromal cells in this, at least the way we grow them. Um, in our in our culture conditions, these are purely tumor epithelium. Um, and there are also, uh, as you know, that there are, um, there are no immune cells. The matrix that is surrounding these tumors are not, uh, these organoids are not comparable to that what is seen in an in vivo patient. So this raises multiple questions. Are we gonna, should we now go back and begin to remodel these things um, and then start uh, thinking about clinical applications and, and translation value, or should we go ahead? So we took the approach of maybe we should just go ahead and see if uh, whether organoids can predict uh, drug response in a patient and in vivo. And the reason um, my lab took this approach is because if we fail in being able to predict, then we realize that we can go back and now go to the drawing board and begin to model these things. But if we succeed in terms of being able to use the existing pure epithelial cultures, perhaps this is actually would be a good, great place to begin to uh, translate some of these findings. So before we really went, wanted to go into the clinic, we wanted to take a step back and, and ask a very simple question because as, you, as some of you or those of you who are trying to convince um, the, the, the uh, medical oncologist to, to change their clinical practice based on what you're telling them, that is not a small task. So you need to have enough body of evidence to be able to convince them that we have enough reason to believe that what we're telling is true. So what, um, what the medical oncologists in the medical field will listen to today is either uh, targeted medicine, which is where you have a mutation for a specific oncogene, and then if you have a drug that targets that oncogene, and if you convey to them that maybe this is a drug to give it to the patient, they will listen to that and they will be able to implement it to the clinic. Also, if you have a PDX tumor where you tested the drug and then you show the data to them, there the medical oncologists and the insurance companies will be able to allow um, a, such a treatment to go forward because it is now accepted that the drugs that work in the PDX models will actually be relevant um, for, for the patient. And I'll show you one of, um, there are multiple studies that have shown this, and I think this is probably one of the largest um, comparisons that was made. So I just, it, it's worth taking a minute for, for me to introduce you to this. So this was a study done by medical, by, by um, Champions Oncology. Um, and they, they took 92 patients and the patients received 129 treatments. They generated PDX models for all 92 patients and they actually tested the 
um, uh, the, the PDX model for 129 treatments and asked what is the relationship between the response in the PDX and the clinical response. And it was quite striking. The ability of the PDX to have a positive predictive value was 85%. And the ability of the PDX model to uh, have a negative predictive value, meaning the drug won't work, is 91%. Overall, it is, it is a significant uh, confidence that the PDX models are in fact robust uh, indicators of patient response. And while PDX models are powerful, there are two major um, caveats as far as pancreas cancer goes. One is that the timeline to generate a PDX model and, um, and test all the drugs is too long for a patient, a pancreatic cancer patient, who is in a very short timeline in terms of their clinical outcome. The second is it is very expensive and you won't be able to do all the combinations. So we realized that if we can do this approach where we take organoids from PDX models and test them between or in PDX and organoids, uh, then we may be able to make the, make the case that A equals B, B equals C, so A equals C, if you know what I mean. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was we took a set of matched uh, PDX models and organoid models. We tested them for cancer biology, we tested them for genetics, we test, tested them for drug response, and we used this as a platform to really understand how do we do the drug treatment assays uh, in organoids so that we, we know how to interpret them for in vivo response. So these were the models selected. Um, they have all the combinations of mutation profile that is relevant, thought to be relevant for pancreatic cancer. Uh, these are the top um, mutated genes. And you can see some models have very high mutation burden. Some models have very low mutation burden. And these were deliberately chosen uh, for the sake of this comparison. We generated organoids. And the organoids, again, um, as we always do, looked, looked like the PDX tumor in vivo. So this organoid, um, it looks more like this tumor and not like this tumor and so forth. And so then we, we, uh, we can also, we looked at the um, mutation profile of these organoids and also compared to the matched PDX and the same alleles on the mutation frequency was present both in the organoid and, um, organoid and the P matched PDX tumor, giving us the confidence that the mutations are in fact conserved in the organoids and they didn't, we didn't really select them in culture to deviate from the PDX tumor that we got it from. So then we took these organoids and we tested them um, against um, four, um, three different drug combinations that is routinely clinically used and a fourth one that is um, experimental at that time. We had tested them as single and double agents and I won't show you all the data, but I'm happy to answer any questions on that topic. Um, we tested all of them and the idea was to take these combinations and proportionately test, uh, mix, the, mix the proportions in a way that is clinically meaningful. And then do a complete dose response and calculate the area under the curve values. And the way we did them was, if, for example, if you take 5FQ, um, and depending on the concentration, you have a very low response versus a very high response. And as you can tell, that the, the drug doses, and again, the doses were chosen to, to be within the C min C max value of, of the drug, which is this is the um, uh, drug available in a patient's blood at any given time at the maximum and the lowest. And that is why we don't have 100% cell killing because if you take the drug to 100 micromolar, for example, it'll kill all cells. And we didn't think that was clinically meaningful, so we only stuck to the ranges that were uh, clinically meaningful. And when we calculated the AUCs, and the way to interpret the AUCs is that um, the AC value, a high AC value of three, which means no cell, there was no cell death, and if there is a zero AC value, then 100 percent of the cells died. So, for example, here the gempaclitaxel is the most effective combination in this organoid line compared to the uh, five of oxaliplatin combination. So we just, we took this information, we went to the in vivo context and asked, what is it? How do the patient, how do the PDX tumors respond to the same drug combination? So here in blue is the gempaclitaxel, and here in blue is the gempaclitaxel, and then um, 5-FU oxaliplatin um, is, is in red here, and this is the tumor response in vivo. And likewise, you can see another tumor here. So we did this for all six pairs, and there was a one-to-one -one correlation where almost all the time, uh, where the best responding drug in culture was, was also the best responding drug in vivo. And here are all the AAC values that we, um, what we generated for these ones. And you will see it's a broad range. Some of them was less than one, some of them was actually three or more. It means they were actually had no effect and probably had um, some stimulatory effect, which we don't know why. 
But what was interesting is that if you look at this broad range, then we asked, is this really AEC values telling something about the way in which um, they, they predict the response in vivo? And when we plotted them uh, of AEC values as, as a function, we still begin to see that there were some cutoffs. There, were, there, there was a, a slope here, there was another slope here, and there was another slope here, and then, then uh, and a fourth one here. And we can now use uh, some mathematical procedures um, where we can segregate them into, uh, into groups where the variation within a group is less than the variation between groups. And once we do this analysis, we begin to understand that there is probably some uh, groupings in which the AUC values can be set. Now the question is, what is the relationship between these groupings and the in vivo response to this uh, in the PDX matched PDX tumor? And to our surprise, what we found was that there was actually um, a clear segregation with the one exception here, that these, um, these PDX response, this is complete response or partial response based on the Jackson lab criteria, um, that the patient, the, the, uh, the organoids that showed an, an a value of about 1.5 or 1.6 um, always had a, a complete response compared to any organoid that had AUC value of higher than 1.6. Um, so this gave us that maybe that we are actually looking at a way in which we can understand the p-values in the context, uh, sorry, understand the AUC values in the context of in vivo response. And if you now do sensitive versus resistant, what, what we see was that the, the concordance for sensitivity was four out of five and the resistance was eight out of nine. So there is an 85, greater than 85% accuracy to be able to predict using this approach for what works in an organoid and what works in in vivo or in a PDX tumor. So this was actually strong enough for us um, to now ask the question, you know, can we take the same logic and into the clinic and ask, will this predict patients in, uh, will, can, we, can this be used in a clinical setting? So uh, we got a um, few medical oncologists on board um, and primarily driven by Vanny Hidalgo, who's my uh, close collaborator, collaborator uh, and partner of crime, if you will. Um, and we generated this, uh, we, we, we wrote this clinical trial called the HOPE trial um, for, the, for a simple reason that I really hope it works. And also, we think if it works, it'll be very hopeful for the pancreatic cancer patient. And, and I think the idea was to use these organoids to ask whether can organoids be used uh, to personalize cancer treatment. So the, the, um, uh, the, the strategy was simple, where we go from a patient generate a, a, a drug response and then take it back to the clinic. Um, however, taking back to the clinic and implementing in the clinic requires uh, significant FDA approval. So we, we are, although we are, this is where we're heading to, but we, were, we did an interim analysis and I'll show you that. And the layout of this trial is very straightforward. All comers, patients with any pancreatic can disease or cancer going through any biopsy are enrolled because we wanted to know what works and what doesn't work. Um, so the goals were very simple. The endpoints was we want to demonstrate this is feasible, um, and then once we dis, once we know it is feasible, or, or while we uh, establish feasibility, we also want to take a handful of uh, organoid lines and then do an extensive uh, drug testing in culture, and then go back to the patient's medical records uh, in a prospective manner and ask whether the organoid response and the patient response matched with each other. And can one predict the other, especially can organoid predict the um, patient's response. If these two are successful, we believe that this actually will set the stage for a proper clinical trial where it's an where the the, um, um, the the findings from organoids can be implemented in the clinic to change clinical practice. And that's the stage we are we are hoping to get to. So if you look at the patients um, that were enrolled in the study. Um, they come in all flavors and sizes. So you have um, a, a good distribution of patients who are uh, male and female, and they also spread out in multiple stages from stage one to stage four. We have liver meds, we have lung meds and other sites, and we have even had one ascites in this case. Um, so then we, uh, from these patients, we took 14 different organoid lines. And you can tell these 14 ones, either they were primary tumors or more metastases. They were collected by different modalities, and the size is also arranged, the tumor size also arranged between the patients. Um, and then we did some basic characterization. Uh, if you look at the, um, um, the phenotype of these patients, uh, of these tumors, some of them are in fact classical type, some of them are basal type. So for example, uh, patient three 
expresses GATA6, uh, which is considered to be a classical marker, whereas patient six has keratin 17, which is a uh, basal marker. And so these patients are negative for GATA6 and patient three is negative for, um, uh, for, for uh, keratin 17 and so forth. So the bottom line is that we maintain uh, biology of these tumors, we maintain heterogeneity in, in, their, in their phenotype, um, and then uh, we, we are able to now use them for clinical testing. So we looked at the patient history um, for these 14 patients. These 14 patients received multiple drugs, um, and if you now tab tabulate each and every drug they received, they received 42 different drugs. So we went to the organoids and we tested the organoids for these 42 different drugs, calculated um, AUC values for them, and, and then began to analyze. So the idea was to take about six dose different, uh, doses of the drug, measure cell depth, and then calculate the AUC values. And here's one example. Um, this for, in this patient, if you take fulfurinox, there are three drugs in the fulfurinox, which is 5-FU, um, oxaliplatin, and irinotecan, which the lab equivalent is SN38 the metabolized compound of irinotecan. Um, and for, so in this case, these are um, only on, so this is the irinotecan value, and this is 5 fu and oxaliplatin. These two had no effect at all in terms of uh, having, um, uh, 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 killing the uh, organoid, whereas uh, SYN38 had a, a pretty, pretty good um, killing effect on these organoids. So when we did, the, I took all the AUC values and did the same, bio, same analysis like what we did for the PDX tumor. Here it grouped into three different groups, meaning the variation between these groups um, was, was less compared to the variation between these two groups. So then we asked, how does, this, how does this grouping relate to the patient response? So we went back to the patient records for all the 14 patients and who were clinically, um, which is clinically annotated to know which patients progressed on the disease, what patients actually maintained in the disease, what would patients actually respond, give or were responsive to the treatment. And to our surprise, the, the data was beautiful. Um, so that we actually found that patient organoid lines that had a low AUC value that actually fell into this first group um, in the clinical setting were all clinical responders, at least what, that, what um, the, the, the medical oncologist diagnosed them as. Or, whereas the patients who are to the, to the right of this cutoff value, they were all non-responders. So this really gave us tremendous, con or giving us tremendous confidence that in fact, if we take an organoid line, if we do a complete dose response for a panel of drug, and based on the AUC value, we can say with some level of confidence that the way the patient is going to respond to the drug or not. Keep in mind that, um, I think I have a table somewhere, maybe not. Um, keep in mind that when we did this experiment, we're only testing single agents. And the patients get combinations. So when we, when we did this, uh, when we uh, compared the responses, as long as the patient has one responsive drug in the combination, the patient shows a response. So which means m the drugs that are currently being tested are used in the clinical pancreas, probably mostly active in additive or, uh, or manner, or probably complementary manner, and they're not really having a synergistic effect. And the combinations can be simply dialed down to one of the most effective drugs in that combination, which is what we think. And this is a working hypothesis as we moving forward to pancreas. So here is a, a summary that the clinical concordance is pretty high. And I think um, we are fairly confident that in fact, we can do this uh, for matching the response. So in addition to matching the response, um, there is also an important uh, element to the, the, in the clinical care, which is we can remove ineffective drugs because some of the patients are highly, um, generate significant level of toxicity to some of these combinations, especially Falfurinox, because uh, it is a really strong drug and so many patients cannot tolerate the combination. And that's why they move to other um, drugs that have either uh, like gemabraxine and other things that have less toxicity compared to Falfurinox. Um, so we asked, is this really an approach where um, ineffective drugs can be removed? And I'll show you one example where we think that actually tells us this is possible and it can be hugely beneficial in the clinic. So here is one patient. The most effective drug in this patient were, uh, for, for all the drugs we tested in the patient's organoid was SN38, which is irinotecan. Second was trametinib. And the other, all the drugs were actually uh, less effective. 
So here's a patient, this is one of the patients, um, and the only drug the patient was responding to uh, was for fear not. So for example, this is a CA99, which is tumor marker, um, and the tumor marker was very high when the patient got a biopsy and we got this biopsy for organoids. And the patient went on for fear not and the tumor marker started dropping significantly. However, in, at this point, the patient was held giving the drug because the patient started having significant level of toxicity. The patient uh, tumor by genomics, um, interestingly, had a HER2 amplification or HER2 mutation. So the, the oncologist uh, decided to switch out of fulfirinox and try trametinib and lapatinib combinations. But the tumor marker um, kept going up. But we were not able to give fulfirinox because the patient could not tolerate the drug. We found in the organoid testing result that in fact the, the um, cisplatin um, is, is least effective, whereas the 5-FU and even the TCAN may be effective. Coincidentally, the, uh, the uh, medical oncologist also decided to try a different combination of fulfirinox called nal irinotecan, which is it's an, um, it's an irinotecan combination uh, with, with, with the 5-FU um, and without cisplatin. And the patient started showing response. Um, and I think the patient actually um, was able to respond to the treatment and also feel much better than how she was before. And so she actually decided to pay a visit to the lab uh, and thank us for what the work we are doing. Unfortunately, the patient is no longer with us. She did, um, she did succumb to the disease a few months ago. Nevertheless, it makes the point that in fact, we may be able to use organoids and really take out or add drugs based on how the responses are. And I really hope this is where we are heading in terms of the medicine. And we are now initiating a second phase of clinical trial where we are going to generate organoids, generate the sensitivity results, and we can instruct the patients instruct the medical oncologist to change treatment based on what we see. And I think that, that, that outcome of the study will probably be extremely powerful uh, in, in shaping the future of, uh, of using organoids in the clinical space for pancreatic cancer, and hopefully for other cancers as well. So in the last couple of minutes, um, uh, maybe one, one minute, um, because I lost time there, I only have a couple of slides, how, where we are going with the organoids in the immune space. And as you know, this is actually, the, the next frontier in, in cancer biology. So we think we can now um, have autologous cultures of organoids and PBMCs and use this autologous culture to, to purify tumor targeting T cells from the patient's peripheral blood, um, not, not the tumor infiltrating T cells. And so we have developed conditions where we can grow them together and we generate a population of T cells called organoid prime T cells. And for lack of time, I won't go into the details, I'll just show you one movie say that when you put them together, the green is a tumor and the unlabeled are the T cells. And in 24 hours, they just completely obliterate the tumor organoid uh, um, effectively uh, in, in the majority of these cases. So we've done significant amount of work. Uh, we are in the process of getting this story for publication. Uh, so we have complete phenotypic characterization of T cells. We've understood the biology of how they kill, what mechanisms they use. We are now um, um, uh, testing how they work in vivo and so forth. And I think this could be a really powerful tool for identification of tumor targeting T cells that can be used in either adaptive T cell therapy, finding PCRs, finding antigens and so forth, which I think is really an exciting new frontier uh, for the efforts we are doing right now. So at this point, I will stop here and, and say that this is what I started with my job, uh, job talk I told you. But this, we have come a long way as biology people. We are doing, um, we're doing 3D culture and many of you listening to um, this talk are, are probably thinking about patient drive models. Two, days, two years ago, um, you know that Nature Methods identified um, uh, organoids as the method of the year. Um, so this really is a long way for us from where we are uh, and where we were and where we are now. So I will, I will um, say that uh, for all the trainees listening, flow forward, bring organoids and patient-derived models into your research enterprise, and, and you will sure to be um, benefiting from using these models for your own discovery and efforts. So I'll stop here and take any questions if there is, and I will thank the people who, key people who did the work. Link Wong pioneered the, uh, the methods. Deepika established all the organoids for the clinical trial. Joe and Bruno and Manny are all medical oncologists who are part of the team and do a lot of work. Shinda, Chen Chen, and Raylin are involved in the, um, in, in the organ prime T cell work. And there's a strong collaboration with Steve Allage here and Doug Melton's group and John Brogy and Irvine. 
and, and Sunil, and, and all the analysis is done by uh, Lakshmi uh, here at the agency. And I'll stop and take any questions.